Elizabeth and James, named after James and Elizabeth Olsen, was actually begun by their twin siblings, Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen, as a pseudo secondary line to their now cult favourite brand, The Row. And in fact, though it came at the cost of Elizabeth and James, it may have been exactly the key to The Row's success. Elizabeth and James was founded in 2007 with this Autumn Winter 07 collection. But it wasn't founded, as most celebrity brands are, as a pure cash grab, solely for the money. Instead, it had a well-considered purpose. You see, only in the previous season, Spring-Summer 07, had The Row been launched with this collection as part of a scheme by the team behind the Olsons to move their product offering along with their fanbase into an older target market. This scheme, in fact, had been long in development and can be traced back to late 2004 when their best-known products were their teen tween clothing items sold through a very successful licensing deal with Walmart that had debuted in July 2002. However, this deal, which was produced through Le Corral, didn't offer the Olsons much creative input and considering their fanbase was aging out of their very narrow 8-12 to year old demographic, the repeat purchases were likely already beginning to wane. In order to combat this and to remain relevancy, the Olsons set a quite dramatic, albeit well-informed, plan to completely restructure their consumer-facing output. The first part of which would be noticed in January 2005 with the sole acquisition of their entertainment company, Dual Star, after they bought out the man who had begun the company with them when they were six, Robert Thorne, and replaced him with Diane Reichenberger, a woman with a very long history in retailing and fashion specifically. It's really through Diane Reichenberger that the Olsons would begin to reposition themselves as retailing moguls after winding down their Walmart license and launching The Row in 2006 for Spring-Summer 07 as a high-luxury offering aimed at 30-60-year-old to 60 year old high-powered women. However, Considering fashion is very seldom profitable for small businesses, especially at this luxury price point, and the fact that their fanbase was not quite yet at 30, this would need to be backed up with a more reliable source of income. Hence why, in Autumn Winter 07, Elizabeth and James would be launched through a licensing deal with the same LA-based company that produced their Walmart collection, Le Corral. Which means, as you can see, Elizabeth and James structurally had very little to do with the row but was still connected through the Olsen twin celebrity factor, which would have worked a bit like a weenie, causing both brands to benefit from the addition of the other. The Row, by having a brand with better profit potentiality to fund the growth and product development, and Elizabeth and James with the Row's cultural capital as a luxury brand. Though, especially in the early days, as the Row was still only in the growth phase with a few direct fans, the Row was undoubtedly seeing more benefit from Elizabeth and James's existence than vice versa, especially considering Elizabeth and James was far heavier promoted as Mary Kate and Ashley's brand than the Row was, though they did also do celebrity endorsement for that brand as we discussed in my video. Actually, if we use the BCG matrix to visualize this, for the individuals behind the companies, so for Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen specifically, the Row would have been a question mark brand while Elizabeth and James would have been intended to be a cash cow brand. In short, though this seems complicated for the launch of a fashion company, it's certainly intentional to offer their own luxury fashion offering financial security. I.e., they needed to fund their passion project, and this was the way that they could do that. So, how successful was Elizabeth and James at offering exactly that? Well, it's hard to say. We don't have any form of numbers for the early years, but considering this was a license agreement and it was producing initially four collections per year, it at least won't have been loss-making and potentially was even quite successful, as within the same year as Launch, it was described as one of the group's most famous brands after Le Corral was sold to VF Corp for $775 million by the founder and the 50% stakeholder Bear Stearns Company. Clearly, the company was doing well right from the jump, and VF Corp was a parent who could obviously see the potential in celebrity branding as it was a huge trend at this time. As such, they really began pushing the Olsons as part of the brand, as is obvious from this Nima Marcus supposed launch party from October 2007, which actually showcased either their second or third collections. And as part of their plan, they would soon begin an expansion plan on the Olsons' product offering, 
obtaining a shoe license with Steve Madden all within the same year. However, before that actually came into the stores, the entire parent company, Le Corral, would be sold to Jane Siskin, then the president of the company, and a silent partner who bought all the shares from both VF Corp and the founder Peter Corral, who still remained a minor stake. This is a lot of information, so just as a summary. 2005, the Olsen Sport Door Star and replaced Robert Thorne with Diane Reichenberger. The Corral was sold 50% to Bear Stearns Company and their Walmart line was wound down. 2006, the row is founded under Door Star. 2007, Elizabeth and James debuted. They signed a shoe licensing deal and Le Corral was sold to VF Corp. 2008, they released said shoe line in a shoe licensing deal with Steve Madden through Le Corral. 2009, Le Corral is sold 100% to Jane Siskin and partner and Le Corral is renamed to the Jaya Group. But of course, things in no way slowed down from there. Throughout the year 2009, Jane Siskin oversaw a great expansion to the Olsons brands as they expanded Elizabeth and James's product depth with Elizabeth and James menswear, which released in Barney's New York, and a jewelry line licensed by Robert Lee Morris. Meanwhile, the Corral would continue to diversify income streams for the twins with the launch of Olson Boy at JCPenney targeting the teens and tweens, Patterson J. Kincaid as a youth-oriented contemporary label, and with StyleMint.com, which though is owned by Beachmint, Jaya was producing the monthly t-shirt given with the subscription service, so they still earn money that way. So, Elizabeth and James and the other Jaya Group offerings were growing, and they were growing very quickly. The Olsons were adding more brands to their portfolio, and because of the retail space and the mid-luxury price point, within just a few years from launch, Elizabeth and James had secured a position as their recession-proof affordable luxury offering which is also a promising area of retail in the late 2000s, early 2010s, with brands like Tory Burch, Coach and Todd's all in the same category, filling the same need in the market. To capitalise on this, it didn't take long for Elizabeth and James to expand again into a denim line in 2010 named Textile Elizabeth and James. This ended up being a real turning point for the brand, as something they were actually rather explicit about in interviews at the time was their plans to expand this diffusion line, Textile Elizabeth and James, into its own full diffusion line later in the same year as a lifestyle brand. This then led to heavier promotion than previous expansions and cleverly saw the Olsons specifically use the launch to point out the brand's critical strengths of their celebrity factor and their unusually close proximity to the design of each piece, totally unlike other celebrity lines that were regularly doubted for their authenticity. They did so with simple product origin stories, highlighting a pair of jeans named Stevie that were reworked from a pair of jeans that they had in high school, which of course also plays into fan servicing that their customers were obviously demanding. Furthermore, the collection was actually only three pieces strong at launch, with styles named the Stevie, the Hendrix and the Joni, all of which launched exclusively at Bergdorf Goodman, Neiman Marcus and Intermix, which exampled a caution in both the product depth and in distribution exclusivity in a way that suggested that they were just testing the field before expanding further, cleverly mapping consumer demand so that they can tailor the upcoming lifestyle brand offering as benefits delivered to what the customer wants or what's known as the benefit sort. In short, they planned this slow rollout specifically so they could listen to their customers. As it happened, the expansion didn't actually happen until 2011, but as it expanded, it ended up absorbing the menswear line previously released in the process, refocusing that on higher margin items. Resulting that in the end, Elizabeth and James was no longer just a licensed brand that the row could make money through, but now it was its own standalone brand. And this makes sense, right? If you think about the row, this is a brand you want to buy one shirt or coat or bag from and keep it forever. There's no or little repeat purchasing just because you plan to keep the items. But with Elizabeth and James, which is more trend based, the customer may want to repurchase every few months or even every year as styles go out of date, meaning the customer needs to return, maybe buys more than one thing while they're in the store, and over time they end up spending significantly more as time goes on. Then you multiply that by each new customer that repeat purchases every six months or so, and by each product that is on a repurchase timeframe, it accumulates into 
such a significant amount more profit than just a one-time customer. This is exactly why brands make so much money from things like sunglasses, swimwear, bags, and trend-based clothing, because as well as being often high-margin items, they're also on shorter repurchase timeframes than, say, quiet luxury coats or trousers, almost regardless of the price point at which you buy them. So, it makes sense that they were making quite a lot of money in this time, and it makes sense that they would continue to release these cash cow products including eyeglasses in 2011, an exclusive fragrance line in partnership with Sephora that was announced in 2012 but released in 2013, they launched Elizabeth and James handbags in 2013, and in 2014 announced makeup that was soft launch with a tie-in to the perfume. However, what's even more interesting about the release of all of these products is, because the row, their luxury label, was in a period where they were supposedly removing Mary Kay Nashley from promotional materials, Elizabeth and James ended up really seeing the benefit of all of that celebrity endorsement. And not only from the Olsen family either, but from major celebrities at the time like Beyonce, Miley, Rihanna and Anne Hathaway who were all seen in their clothes. And considering that their last obviously celebrity endorsed product, their Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen perfume line which released their final product South Beach Chic six years prior in 2007, there was definitely space for their fan base to welcome new fan service products. Especially in this realm of commodity products, as this book describes, things like perfumes and makeup, which are a more tested way of monetizing that parasocial relationship between celebrity and fan. This was only then boosted the following year in 2015, when Mary Kay and Ashley would make the brave decision, alongside minor investor Tom Kartsotis, to buy back the license agreement from the Java Group in order to move the company in-house to also be under Dollstar alongside the row in a move that both sides describe as a mutual agreement just based off of the contract coming to a close and the need for the brand to be heavily tied to the Olsen Twins star influence. So, the brand was really on the top of the world of retail copious cash cows, lots of repeat purchase possibilities, and clearly a large fan base for the brand itself. However, while this completely makes sense on paper, and brought them their most successful year to date with between 40 to 50 million in apparel and accessories alone, with a further 18 million coming in perfumes, it actually would have a detrimental effect on the business after they were forced to restructure large swathes of the company including finding new distributors for their perfume lines to a new company named Beauty Butterfly, and building a whole new design and marketing team from scratch, given that the previous team was hired by Le Corral and not by Dollstar directly, and so they were just required to stay on with Le Corral to work on future projects, forcing Elizabeth and James to skip the spring 16 season. You see, the thing is, no matter how much any one designer claims that they design everything, it is always a huge group effort to put together a collection. And every designer running a business relies on help because it is such an enormous task. So to remove the team that knew the brand so intrinsically, beginning in this pre-Fall 2016 collection, unfortunately will cause foundational cracks in the business to start forming as they debuted the collection with a totally new look. Though, while I say this, it's important to note that the cracks weren't chasms of very obvious issues just yet, but instead just small issues that would slowly come to affect the brand. Because, you see, for now, the brand outwardly was actually doing rather well after in the same year, 2015, they expanded Elizabeth and James Nirvana, their cosmetics line, into hair care with dry shampoo. Then in 2016, they found funding from a new backer in Bedrock Manufacturing Co., opened a store in Melrose Place in Los Angeles, and launched all of their six fragrances in the UK, adding to their current international offering. However, that actually would be their last real expansion, as it appears that throughout 2017, those aforementioned cracks would only continue to deepen. Resulting in 2018, Sephora goers noting the perfumes and dry shampoo were missing leaving these forum users to find that it was now only being sold in the sales section of Sephora or on Groupon, noting other notable stockists Ulta to have also dropped the product line. 
Of course, this set off alarm bells because these were massive stockists that seemingly simultaneously dropped a well-selling brand without a statement or scandal. Even more confusing also, as their last collection, Autumn Winter 18, was the last to show in February 2018. However, fans were left curious, as the reason to all of this would only come a full year later in 2019, after it was revealed that Elizabeth and James had gone through a large period of downsizing the entire company, in which Bedrock, the previous shareholders, pulled out, they closed their LA store, ended contracts with most, if not all, of their stockists, and laid off all design employees. In the same article, a former employee told the business of fashion that they believe the fall of the brand was due to the purchase from Jaya taking the brand in-house. They state that it was at that time that the company made a feeble attempt at repositioning to be like a diffusion line of the row, something we, as well as Vogue, noticed after their design language changed abruptly to something more in line with the row's design language and quality level instead of its own standalone mid-price line. Something that does actually seem quite clear when looking at the store, which has more of a tone of a more high-end brand than one would have expected from a contemporary label. Something the employee also cited as the reason the brand eventually fell in the same article. Simply, the Olsons were discontented with the quality of their mid-priced garments and wanted something more upmarket with a better quality that they would actually want to wear themselves and thus reposition the brand without the right research and development time leading the repositioning to be confusing to the customer who previously was a trend-led younger person as opposed to their new target of 20 to 30s plus women who just can't afford the row, confusing to the team who were meant to design the clothes and clearly not explicit enough to communicate that there had been a reconceptualization of the brand just to the wider audience. It reminds me a bit of Dr. Edwin Land, who was the founder of Polaroid, who in the 70s tried to innovate with his company without doing enough research on the market or its own customer, and subsequently sunk millions and very unhealthy amount of money into Polar Vision and almost completely bankrupted the company in the process. It came back later, of course, but certainly not because of Land, who was actually forced to leave the company that he had begun because he nearly tanked it. Likewise, the Olsons had wanted to buy the company to reposition it at a higher price point, but because it wasn't done confidently or obviously enough for either the new team nor the customer to understand and get on board with the reposition, it ended up causing a period of really bad sales that caused stockists through the years 2017 and 2018 to just drop off, resulting in a very quick demise for a once very stable company. They did retain some staff, however, and signed an exclusivity contract with Coles in the process. But of course, Coles is a much lower price point and for a much different consumer than either the original brand or the Olsen's new version of the brand had gone for. And so naturally, after a third iteration, it just wasn't as strong of a brand anymore and most people didn't expect it to last much longer. It certainly could have, don't get me wrong. But you tie into that the 2019 rather lacklustre sales at Coles in general, who despite a real push during the holiday season saw comparable sales from the previous year dip 0.2%, which I know doesn't sound like a lot, but considering the extra cost of the big promotional push, this actually would have really hurt the company, especially considering it was going into the pandemic. As it happened, Elizabeth and James's last Instagram post was on July 17th, 2020, and at least according to the speculation of Coles employees, they exited their only stockist in 2021, perhaps just because they didn't fit their discount-loving demographic. Today, it's hard to know if the company itself is fully closed or if it's just been benched waiting for a return. My personal guess is that it hasn't technically closed just because it seems available on Amazon, but we also assume that there are probably no or very few staff behind it just because, well, firstly, there's no social media anymore, there's no ads and all the clothing looks very generic, so it, it just looks licensed. I'm just not sure who buy to be very sure of that. Is there room for a return? 100%. The row is so famous today that it easily could be used as a diffusion line. But then that kind of goes against the ethos of the row, no? If the whole idea of the row is to buy less clothes but to buy quality ones and make them last, that doesn't leave a huge amount of room for a diffusion line which is often a watered-down version of more out-there design work or just a cheaper version of what they already make, both of which already exist in other brands and at multiple price points. 
So really, on both sides, there's not a ton of room for the road diffusion line. But of course, I am always happy to be surprised. I'm sure there is demand there. But today, it seems unfortunately there isn't really that much interest in Elizabeth and James. I could find almost nothing on them since around 2020, and so it's just hard to gauge how much desire there is from the fans of the row. Though we know one thing for sure, at least Elizabeth and James did its job. It funded the row when it needed funding until it no longer really needed it. Thank you so much for watching this video. For more videos like this one, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. For videos like this but about beauty brands, check out my second channel and a special thank you to my patrons over on Patreon, some of whose names are on the screen now.